If you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to Mark chapter 2. Last night about 1.30 in the morning, I was uh, thinking of the lyrics of a pop song. And I was thinking about it because yesterday afternoon, I... Uh, I threw my back out, so at 1.30 in the morning, I was laying there, and every little move you made would be this major twinge, and I was remembering how wonderful it is not to have that. <laughs> Joni Mitchell, probably her most quoted line of all her pop lines, don't it always seem to go? that you don't know what you got till it's gone. I heard a couple of you talking about that on the way in in relation to electricity. <laughs> um, uh, lose your electricity for a couple of days and you, you're reminded of how wonderful electricity is. But for others of you, it's it's a lot worse than a little back problem or electricity for a couple of days. It's major things that were once in your life that are gone, like your general overall health. And now you're on a schedule of chemotherapy treatments and radiation treatments. Or now as our friend from our congregations, a little update from own Don Smith had open heart surgery a couple of weeks ago. I'd been trying to get a hold of him at a valve replace, but it was the full open heart surgery. And finally, he called me yesterday to say that everything went really well, but seven hour surgery and, and now many, many weeks of recovery with a number of those weeks where you can't drive and things like that, right? So don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone. But what I was thinking about that lyric, I thought of another lyric that I learned in Sunday school. And it's a great lyric and it ties into our text that we're about to read from this morning really directly. And that little lyric that they taught us to sing went this way. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All you have to do is follow. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. And some of you look out at where you are in life right now and you see the most intimidating wilderness laid out before you and around you. And you wonder how in the world, how in the world Am I going to do this? And that little Sunday school song is, is really a profound biblical theological answer to that question. Well, remind yourself, the Lord knows the way. All you have to do is follow. Let's stand together. Mark chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Mark chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose, and he followed him. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, when we look around our lives in any given moment, in any given set of circumstances, we can find ourselves in an intimidating place. But this is never true for you. 
As the psalmist says of you, how lovely is the dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs yet faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. For though we are often in doubt, you are never in doubt. Though we are often fearful and confused, you are never either fearful or confused. You are always a place of absolute, everlasting stability, trustworthiness, steadfast love. And you invite us to make our home with you. As the psalmist says, blessed are those who dwell in your house, O God, ever singing your praises. Now, you are able to bring into even our troubled lives springs in the desert, rain that covers our parched lives with pools, hopeful pools, and we often need it. For we're often overwhelmed by what lay ahead, what lay around us, by what threatens us, by what lays us down. And so we ask, Lord, you know exactly where each of us are, and some of us are in happier places, and some of us are in very overwhelming places. Oh, Lord, hear our prayer. Give ear to us as your children. And may we be clear upon this, as the psalmist says, that better is one day with you in your courts, in your presence, in your family, than a thousand anywhere else. That if we know this, that we have a connection with you, that we belong to your house, that we are your children, that we follow your son, that we are in a good place, a safe place, a blessed place, really an amazing place. And that you, the Lord God, are a sun and shield to us. And you are the one who are, is certain in the long run to bestow favor and honor on us. That in the end, where we're headed, no good things will be withheld to those who walk uprightly, to those who follow your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for they are blessed. For in following Christ, they trust in you. And because they trust in you, they follow Jesus. Oh Lord, make us into those kinds of people wherever you have placed us for the moment. Whatever our circumstances may be, we ask for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Pastor Don reminds us every week, and most weeks I remind you that he reminded us. <laughs> we are becoming disciples. Now, in our text for this morning, how that comes into play is that it is roughly uh, a synonymous statement with we are becoming disciples to say, we are becoming followers of Jesus. What it means to be a follower of Jesus is to be a disciple. 
And what it means to be a disciple is to be a follower of Jesus. But I warn you, I warn you, that unlike in this story, most people are following someone in something that the beginning of that following, the decisiveness of it, wasn't nearly as clear as it is in our story this morning with Levi, where Jesus comes walking by and says, follow me. We're all followers. But most people this morning are following someone or something and they're probably not even really aware that they're following that person, that set of people, that mindset. They just sort of came into it. You didn't know what happened to them. This is all of us in some way, some aspect of our lives. When we moved from Rockford, Illinois to Wonder Lake, Illinois, I was nine years old and I knew nothing and cared nothing about uh, Major League Baseball, let alone any particular team. But by the time I was 11 years old, I could be thrown into despair by the loss of a game by the Chicago Cubs. And I could be brought into elation over the same thing. How did that happen? Well, we moved within the WGN viewing area for the city of Chicago. But back in the 1960s, there was no lights at Wrigley Field. All home games were played in the afternoon. And so at Johnsburg Elementary School in the springtime, half the days after school, well, you waited for the bus, you waited for the bus in front of a television showing you somewhere around the sixth or seventh inning of the Chicago Cubs baseball game. And so we watched it every day. And there was Jack Brickhouse, and Jack Brickhouse was announcing the game, and he made Chicago Cubs baseball seem about the most exciting thing that you'd ever run across in your life. And had you asked me, like, you know, what the greatest job in the Chicago area was, it might have been a position of the starting nine players for the Chicago Cubs. Nobody more important than them. This never happened, but had I ever run into someone like Billy Williams in the, in the grocery store, I'd still be talking about it today. Um, uh, I'd still be telling you how I came around, and there he was, standing right in front of the peanut butter. Um, and uh, and I, I went up and, and talked to him, and oh, by the way, he uses Jif just like we do uh, at our house. Um, and it would, it, would seem, it would seem pretty exciting to me. But not only WGN, we got the Chicago Tribune in there. You open to the sports section and Chicago Cubs and the White Sox in the summer, but just Chicago Cubs every day. And without even realizing it, to use our language from our text for this morning, which many people use throughout the Chicago area, which you use. Somebody asks you, you a sports fan? And you might say, where I was raised. Yeah, I follow the Cubs pretty carefully, pretty closely. I follow the Cubs pretty closely. And it was true. At 11 years old, I pretty much followed the Cubs in quite a religious sense. A few things in life seemed more important than them. What seems really important to you? And how did that thing become so important 
I'm telling you, you followed somebody into that. You're a follower. We're all followers. Someone. Something. And the appeal of Mark in Mark 2, 13 and 14 is to call us to be consciously, diligently, seriously followers of Jesus Christ. And followers of Jesus Christ more thoroughly and more decisively than we are followers of anyone or anything else. And to do that, he simply tells the story of the beginning of such following for one person, a man named Levi. So here it was, verse 13. And he went again, that is Jesus, went again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose, and he followed him. So our thesis for this morning is simply this. In becoming disciples, we are becoming followers of Jesus. In becoming disciples, we are becoming followers of Jesus. We'll make three observations about this. The first one, uh, we've repeated as part of our sermon for the last four weeks because it's it showed up in the text for four paragraphs in a row. And we're simply going through Mark paragraph by paragraph, and, and here it is again in the opening verse of Mark uh, 2, 13 and 14. Jesus was and is centrally a teacher. Jesus was and is centrally a teacher. See, one, one of the benefits of just moving through a book of the Bible like we are in Mark is that you end up with Mark's emphasis and not the emphasis of your own interest. Mark's emphasis and not the emphasis of whatever preacher you're listening to. Mark's emphasis, and the importance of that is you have Mark's emphasis as the emphasis of the one under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So you have actually the emphasis of the Spirit for the reader through Mark. And here it is again at the end of verse 13. He went out again beside the sea and all the crowd was coming to him. And he was teaching them. Fourth paragraph in a row. With This is a major theme. In the first of those four paragraphs, it comes right at the end, you remember. Verse 38, where the crowd comes out trying to get Jesus to come back into Capernaum, or uh, the disciples come out, try to get him to come back to Capernaum to perform a healing ministry among the crowd, and instead he gives them a twofold purpose statement about, no, no, I need to go in order that I can preach elsewhere, for this is the very purpose that I came into the world. So that's the end of paragraph, ending in verse 38. First verse of the next paragraph, verse 39, emphasis on teaching again. Opening two verses of Mark chapter 2, which is the opening of the next paragraph, emphasis on teaching again. And now opening of the second paragraph in the Gospel of Mark, as we just read it, emphasis on teaching again. And Jesus was teaching them because he was fundamentally and primarily and ultimately a teacher of the Word of God. He has this incredibly high, exalted understanding of written text. In the Sermon on the Mount, he, he describes that this way. He says to his audience, beginning in verse 17, Matthew 5, 17, Don't think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I didn't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, 
will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever teaches them, or keeps them, or does them and teaches them, he will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So first he just says, my whole life is about fulfillment of written text in the Old Testament. Secondly, secondly, the importance of influence, of the influence and the importance of that text will outlast the present universe. That is, the word of God will still be relevant in the new heaven and the new earth when the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. So, if, uh, and he's talking about, so this, this, is, this is another little commercial, you know. So you can come out tonight at 6 o'clock. Pastor Don will be in Exodus 15. Exodus 15 is the very kind of text that he's talking about. The stuff of Exodus 15, the importance of what you study there and read there and learn there, will outlast the present age, the present universe. That's what Jesus says. That's what he said. Never lose any relevance until the entire present universe is gone, until it's passed away. That's a high view of things. And thirdly, thirdly, he says, unlike somebody like myself, who in the early 70s, oh, you know, Billy Williams for the Cubs, he had one really good year in there. He hit, he hit well over 300. He had about 40 home runs. Amazing, amazing year. That is big stuff in the world of baseball. Helped him get into the Hall of Fame. And by the way, Billy's in the Hall of Fame. I never met him in the grocery store, but he is in the Hall of Fame. You see what Jesus says? He says, that's not that, none of that is all that important. None of that really is all that important. What is important? If you are a person who does the word of God and teaches others to do the same, there's nothing greater than that in the kingdom of God. God values that. We you say, any mom and dad can do that. Right in their kitchen. Yes. Yes. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? What, 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 what Jesus considers to be the greatest thing that happens on this earth, you can do today in the kitchen of your house. As you try to live out the word of Jesus and teach your kids, or in the next hour, as you stand before your Sunday school class and you're trying to model and teach them the way. Jesus just says, there's nothing greater than that. That's the great thing. That's the great thing in the kingdom of God. Remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. And we're going to come back to this text I'm about to read at the, when we get close to the Lord's table again. But um, we really already sang what's going on here. I think it was our opening song. It was our opening song. So our, our opening song this morning, the resurrected king is resurrecting me. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. What in the world are you singing about when you sing that? Well, you're singing about this. Um, Jeremiah 31, 33, and 34. And this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
That's what happens to those who are going to be resurrected on the last day. Only it happens to them now. He, in the new birth, he writes their law on their heart. Now it's already going on. And there we were singing about that. God is doing this in the resurrected king. He's resurrecting me. What do you mean by that? He's writing the law on my heart. He's given me a heart for him. He's given me a love for what he says. He's given me a desire to actually follow Jesus. That's what's going on in my life. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. He's writing the law on my heart. But he doesn't do it mystically. He does it by having somebody teach you that law. Teach you that instruction. Whether it be your mom, your dad, your Sunday school teacher, your pastor, Bible study leader, a friend of yours having a conversation with you about theological things. He puts the law within them, and that thing is what transforms our life. I've mentioned so many times, and we moved into a new building in, in Wonder Lake uh, uh, 1970. So when we moved into that building, I would have been 12 years old, and on the pulpit in front of that new sanctuary uh, in, uh, in, in brass lettering was the text, John 17, 17. I've mentioned it many times. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Better to make it clear that's almost a certainly grammatically speaking, that's probably an instrumental dative, what they say. Sanctify them by means of the truth. By means of the truth. Your word is truth. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means you worry less when you're in trouble. Why? Because you have believed the text of Psalm 23 and you believe that the Lord is with you. And by means of believing the Lord is with you, you're calmer than the average person in trouble. Because you really believe God is with me in this mess. And by means of believing that, you're sanctified. You have a different mindset than the average person does. Sanctify them by means of the truth. And that is what the Spirit of God does with the truth. He not only gives it to us through a teacher, but then he writes it on our heart. And the parallel to Jeremiah 31 is Ezekiel 36, 27. I'll put my spirit within you, and I will make you to walk in my statutes, to be careful to obey my rules. There's actually three little verbs there in the, in the Hebrew text. I'll, I'll cause you to walk, to keep, and to do. I'll cause you to walk, to keep, and to do. That's transformation. That's the teaching ministry of Jesus that was central to his ministry and therefore it ought to be central to our lives as Jesus is a teacher then central to us is to be learners of him and we learn so as to follow secondly Jesus called and calls us to follow him verse 14 and as he passed by he saw Levi the son of Alphaeus sitting in the tax booth and he said to him, follow me. Uh, notice Jesus is the one who takes the initiative in somebody becoming his follower. They don't wander into it. They don't randomly get there. The Bible pictures him as taking the initiative or the father as taking the initiative. You know, in a broad sweeping text like, John 6, 44, where God, nobody comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Uh, well, here it's, it's the Son himself drawing Levi after himself, but the Father is also involved, no doubt. But notice what happens if you just take 
uh, uh, the proper noun, Jesus, and substitute it for all of the pronouns, in verse 14, you come up with this. And Jesus passed by, and Jesus saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And Jesus said to Levi, follow me. And as we read the text, from our vantage point, it, would, it, would, it, it comes to us like this. And Jesus passed by, and Jesus saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And Jesus said to us, follow Jesus. Through my, that's what Mark is saying to us. Follow Jesus. Um, now, this following is, in, in, in Levi's case, both literal, geographical, but primarily theological, metaphorical, right? I mean, he literally gets up and just starts walking after Jesus. But that's not the main thing that Jesus has in mind. He's not looking for Levi just to be a person who follows him around geographically. He's looking for Levi to become a person who becomes shaped by what Jesus believes to be important. So it's Jesus who passed by this particular tax collector. And if, if you're a believer, you can think about, um, you know, how you came to faith. Well, the Father was drawing you. Jesus was passing by. That's, uh, and, and you were called by some means, but ultimately... It's, it's Jesus. It's his Father. Um, follow me. Follow me. And metaphorical following means take my word to heart. Respond as I write my word on your heart. I don't know how many times you've heard me. Uh, well, I, I think I quote this, and this is a sanctified thing. I quote, I quote Kevin Van Hooser even more often than I quote Joni Mitchell, which is good. Uh, Kevin Van Hooser's little line, the people of God are called together by God to embody God's word and worship, witness, and wisdom for the sake of the world. That's following. The people of God are called together by God to follow Jesus and you do that by embodying his word in worship, witness, and wisdom for the sake of the world. Or, as John Calvin put it, uh, and just this last Thursday, our men's group, uh, uh, you know, those of you who have been playing hooky on the institutes, you're welcome back. You know, there'll be no, you, you don't have to bring a note from home or anything. You can just, you can just come back. Because you missed, you missed one of the most wonderful places in the institutes this, this last week where Calvin reviews the three uses of the law. You know, the first use of the law is the law such that a person comes to know that they're a sinner and that they desperately need forgiveness. They desperately need a savior. So that's a design that God has in the law. The second use of the law uh, is that um, uh, gives a, a civil society a framework by which to stay sane. And as a society like ours in, increasingly pays less and less um, attention to that, and we, we use this as an illustration on, th on Thursday morning, you know, the the, the, there's, Wal, there's, there's Walgreens that have pulled out of certain neighborhoods in the city of San Francisco. Why? Well, because uh, nobody, nobody in that neighborhood takes it all seriously. A simple word like, you shall not steal. Well, what if everybody in America just ignores, you shall not steal for just one week? I mean, we'll just ignore it all together for one week. There's no retail store left in existence in America in one week. Plus, not much stuff in your house. <laughs> um, right? You can't ignore stuff like that. That's his point, the, the, the law of God is the moral framework that enables a society to survive. 
Now those two, Luther said the same thing, but Luther didn't say the third thing. This is, this is Calvin's insight and he's right on the money. Calvin says, but there's a third principal use of the law. Well, what's that? Well, that one could be in, like paralleled right to our text. Here's how he wrote of it. He said, here is the best instrument for the people of God to learn more thoroughly each day the nature of the Lord's will, which they aspire to, and con to confirm them in understanding it. See, that little, that little verb, that command, it's an imperative, but a present imperative. Follow me. Follow me. Keep on following me. See, Calvin picks up on, on, on that when he talks about Thoroughly each day, thoroughly each day, we remind ourselves of the will of God so that we stay on, in step with it, on, on course to it. We remind ourselves. And if we don't, then we'll start drifting to the world, with the world in all kinds of really terrible things will begin to happen thoroughly each day. Thirdly and finally, Jesus is to be followed. So he calls us, and then we're simply to do what Levi did. Jesus said to him, follow me, and he rose, and he followed him. And he rose, and he followed him. I think it was Thursday, the Wall Street Journal uh, had this headline on there. They, they just have like a single page of sports in the Wall Street Journal. Um, the main guy who writes uh, for them, writes the longest articles, a guy by the name of Jason Gay. And Jason Gay, was the, he was the author of this article. And here was the headline. And you football fans, I'm not much of a football fan, but some of you are dangerously slow. Uh, dangerously so. So here's, uh, here's the, here was the headline. Tom Brady becomes the most important person on TV. And Jason Gay in the rest of that article says, if you think that's, a, if, if you think that's hyperbole, it's only because you don't understand the business of network television. In other words, he's saying, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. This is really a big deal for the network television because network television in football season is funded a lot by network television during football season. And, uh, and, and, and the name of Tom Brady is going to be on Fox uh, in the broadcast booth. Well, that made me think of somebody else who had been in the broadcast booth. He was a famous coach and he started the broadcast booth the year I got married, 1979, and he stayed in the broadcast booth for 30 years. Worked for all four of the major sports networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox. Uh, most all-time uh, of, of coaches that won more than 100 games, he won a higher percentage than any. John Madden. John Madden. Uh, you may have loved hated listening to John Madden. But I remember about him, though, is that he had this little phrase he'd, he'd, he'd dump into this at some point during the game. Uh, uh, it could be in the offensive nine. It, it could be somewhere. But usually, like, the offensive line, the guys are hitting each other, and it's muddy and even. And then he just, and John Madden says, it just doesn't get any better than this. It just doesn't get any better than this. I mean, this, oh, man, this is, this is what football, this is what football is all about. It just doesn't get any better than this. And Mark, at the end of verse 14, is pretty much doing a John Madden when he writes, and he rose and he followed him. That's as good as it gets. That's as good, that's as, good as it gets on planet earth. That's it. That's as good as it gets in the kingdom of God is when 
God speaks ultimately in his son and we follow, it just doesn't get better than that. That is a great moment. That is a fantastic thing. That's what happens in this text. Well, and it's almost impossible to believe that. Because in our culture, evangelicals are now summarized as odd, stupid people who voted for Trump. There it is. There it is. So if you get excited about being an odd, stupid person who voted for Trump, then you can be excited about being an evangelical. But other than that, you can have a hard time being excited because that's what they are. That's what they are on CBS. That's what they are on NBC. That's what they are across the cable networks. They're, they're odd, stupid people who voted for Trump. There's no more dangerous person or people in the world. Now, they were viewed in a similar way in the first century by the Roman Empire. Jews are odd, and the Christian subset of Judaism is the oddest set of those odd people. The despised of the despised. That's the, that's the, that's the milieu that's flowing around when John writes Revelation 14. Now we can't we can't unpack uh, the imagery. You just have to. You're just going to have to take my um, word for it. And many of you won't because you've you've listened to other things on the radio um, in relation to that. Some really this is end times. End times. Well, it is end times, but we're we're in the end times in in many senses. And here's so this is just John describing you describing the people of God. And he uses stunningly, stunningly exalted language and ends on the note that our text ends on following. So here's how he does it. Revelation 14, 1 to 4. And I looked and behold on Mount Zion stood the Lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like a roar of many waters, like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. So it's both majestic, but it's also beautiful. And they were singing a new song before the throne and the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn the song except for the 144,000. Which is a way of saying nobody has the law of God written on their hearts except for those who have been drawn by grace into the new covenant. Nobody can learn the song. Nobody can write. Nobody writes the law in their own heart. God does that. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, double entendre. They don't commit actual fornication and they don't commit spiritual fornication. They're not all cozied up to the Roman Empire great whore in the book of Revelation. And then he says this. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. That's to be us. That's the character trait of Christians. We follow the lamb wherever he goes. We don't do what we feel like doing. We do what the lamb says ought to be done. That's us. We are those who follow the lamb wherever he goes. You say, well, that's not, 
We're pretty lousy at being that. Well, fortunately, the Lamb provides forgiveness. And we're about to go to the Lord's table. And the two main things at the Lord's table are really forgiveness and following. They're both there. They're both clearly there. They're both profoundly there. They're forgiveness and following. But just before we, we go there, just one other text. John, last little statement in the gospel. You remember, Peter has just been asked three times, do you love me more than these? Yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. Yes, I love you. They finally sort of get that taken care of, and then Peter looks over his shoulder, and he sees John following and says, what about him? And then, and then Jesus, in a very... In a, in a nice way, sort of uh, um, tells John, it's, uh, Peter, it's none of his business. And here's how he does it. He says, if he stays until I remain, what's that to you? You follow me. You follow me. You got nothing else to worry about, Peter. You follow me. Well, that's that's to be us. That's to be us. We follow, we follow him. Let me remind you again.